And now it's time to answer some questions, shall we? Time now for everyone's favorite segment of the week. It is time. It's time for a good old fashioned Q and A, MMA fans. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived to hear from the man himself, Ariel Helwani. Live from the Box Studios in beautiful New York City. And now, to answer your questions, get out of your seats and on your feet because here he is, Ariel Helwani. I think my big takeaway from all of that is uh, I really need to up my my video camera game. I mean, DJ puts me to shame. And um, the microphone. What's wrong with my microphone? I think my I microphone mean, is great. Better. Is it really? Yeah. I disagree. You have the MV7. He's got the S7. If, if I had to start, if I had to start with one, the camera has to be updated, right? Yeah. Upgraded, updated. Yeah. All right. Um, what a guy. Uh, what happened to my questions? Oh, here they are. Okay, here we go. Um, number one, Connor from Canada. Hi, Ariel. Can you explain what is going on with the class action lawsuit against the UFC that is now allowing fighters to sue? Seems like a big deal that isn't really being discussed. Thanks. Okay, so it's not... I mean, this has been ongoing for 10 years, but last uh, last week was a big step uh, for that class action lawsuit. And there's a lot of people out there who are covering this very thoroughly. At the top of the list, uh, Eric McGracken, who's also a lawyer based in Canada. He does a tremendous job covering this. And uh, John Nash does a great job for Bloody Elbow. And sometimes I see some people saying like, oh, MMA media is not covering this and should be covering that, or they're covering too much of this and that. You have to understand every beat, you know, people focus on different things. And so, you know, fight news, that's important. And cards, and especially, you know, in this sport where there's no, there's no time off, there's no off season, you get on this treadmill. If you're job requires you to cover every UFC event or every Bellator event. Like it's hard to do this other stuff. So I'm I'm very thankful for the likes of Eric and John who cover the other stuff, maybe the less glorious stuff. Um and who can really focus on the regulation, the legal side of the game. And Eric does a great job of it. Last week, I'm gonna read something here. Uh this is from last Wednesday at almost exactly this time. August 9th, 2023, 425 p.m. Eastern. So almost exactly one week ago, uh, this is from Reuters. Martial arts fighters wage lawsuit against UFC could proceed as a class action lawsuit. A U.S. judge in Nevada on Wednesday said a group of martial arts fighters suing the Ultimate Fighting Championship for alleged suppression of their wages can move forward as a class action seeking damages estimated at between $811 million and $1.6 billion. That's USD, by the way. Uh, U.S. District Judge Richard Bulware's decision grants class action status to more than 1,200 fighters who competed in live professional UFC promoted martial arts or mixed martial arts bouts in the U.S. between December of 2010 and June 2017. A couple fighters reached out to me and said, how can I join this? And if you have fought in that time period, you're just a part of it automatically. So there's nothing to like sign up or join. The plaintiffs contend Nevada-based Zufa which does business at the UFC, abused its market power to acquire or block rival promoters and used exclusive contracts to keep fighters within the UFC. The plaintiffs alleged the UFC suppressed fighters' bout compensation. Quote, the UFC pays its fighters only 20% of its event revenues when boxing and other major sports pay well above 50%, said Eric Kramer, chairman of Berger Montag who is a lead attorney representing the class UFC lawyer William Isaacson of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Warden, and Garrison said Zufa planned to challenge the certification order in an appeal. The UFC has denied any antitrust violations. This is just one step in a long legal process. Isaacson said he also called the lawsuit legally and factually meritless. UFC titled what it called a healthy competi- uh, competitive MMA market, which benefits athletes, promoters, and fans alike. I mentioned Eric McGracken. He actually did a nice little two-minute video recapping the big news last Wednesday. Let's take a look at it. So breaking news, just today, a federal court in the U.S. has certified a class action lawsuit against the UFC. Now, this lawsuit's been going on for the better part of 10 years, and a few years ago, it looked like it was going to be certified. But today, the official reasons came out certifying the antitrust lawsuit. So in a nutshell, a bunch of fighters sued the UFC saying they used illegal techniques 
to acquire dominance in the market and they abused that dominance in the market. And the effect of that has been to underpay fighters drastically over the years. Uh, the lawsuit started by some individual fighters, but they wanted it certified as a class action, meaning hundreds and hundreds of fighters automatically get to participate in it. That's exactly what occurred today with the court's certification order. So there's a class of about 1,200 fighters that are now suing the UFC unless they opt out. And in a nutshell, these are you know, really damning uh, reasons the court released today. They found on a preponderance of evidence that the UFC has used ruthless and coercive practices and in a nutshell, there's three things the court said. Number one, that they use oppressive contracts. Number two, that they use ruthless tactics outside of those oppressive contracts. Uh, and combine those two things, keep fighters from really ever enjoying free agency. And three, the court found that the UFC has bought up competition, not to necessarily make their product better, but instead to give fighters fewer choices on the open market. So the courts found that the UFC has used a series of tactics over a number of years to lock themselves into a dominant market position and that they abuse that power to maintain that position. So this is interesting stuff, folks. This lawsuit is definitely worth keeping an eye on. I mean, that is just tremendous reporting, great journalism. Shout out to Eric and follow him on social media, on Twitter, on TikTok. Uh, so there you have it. There's the latest there. He can summarize it a hell of a lot better than me, but this is obviously not going to end anytime soon, but a massive step forward and a story that we should all be paying attention to. Uh, number two, Cole, good day, Ariel and crew. Thoughts on the two new MMA rules that got passed over the weekend. Bloody Elbow had the breakdown for the rules and proposed new rule. Uh, the approved rules, fighters will have access to a cut man after being cut by a foul or accidental headbutt. Love it. Fighters will have more time to recover from eye pokes before being examined by a doctor. Love it. Clarification around positioning fighters for a restart after a foul warning or physician's examination or a point deduction. Love that. And we also talked about that recently on the show as well. Proposed rule, clarification of how referees can reset fighters' position after a foul. We talked about that as well. Uh, like all these, in fact, uh, let's give some more love to Eric McGracken. He did two videos about these proposed rules. He was at the ABC conference in Las Vegas just a few weeks ago. Take a look at this. Two brand new rules designed to help MMA fighters after they sustain a foul. These were just voted in at the Association of Boxing Commission's conference last week in Nevada. So here they are. Number one, when a foul occurs, whether it's a clash of heads, whether it's uh, an illegal strike of some kind, and you have a cut, Fighters now will have up to five minutes to recover from that cut. And during that time, a cut person could come into the ringer cage and they could tend to that wound. They can't tend to anything else, but they could tend to the wound. So it used to be the fighter had to resume the fight, make it to the end of the round, and only then the cut person could come in. But they've changed that to say, look, the cut person could address it immediately to give that fighter a better chance of being able to continue. Rule number two, this rule is designed to deal with how referees and doctors work together after an illegal eye poke. So when an eye poke occurs, timeout is called and the fighter has up to five minutes to recover. But here's the new nuances. Number one, uh, officials could give the fouled fighter a cold compress and they could put it on their eye to give them some time to recover. After a minute or 90 seconds, only then should the ringside physician come in. And if possible, the doctor shouldn't immediately shine a light in the fighter's eye and say, can you see? Because the answer is often no, they can't see right away. And then the fight is called. Instead, these rules are designed to say, look, give the fighter some time to recover, give them a tool to recover, let the doctor take a quick look at things, but not immediately ask about vision, let the fighter enjoy much of that five minutes, and then and only then ask if their vision is obstructed. And if it is, of course, the bout is over. But if it's not, they had a fair chance to recover. Here's the rules. Stalling fighters 
in mixed martial arts. There's a brand new rule that deals with how referees should address the situation. The unified rules of MMA have just been updated and referees have always had discretion to separate stalling fighters, but it's never been explained how or when they should exercise that discretion. This has now changed. The brand new amendment to the unified rules tells referees that if the competitors fail to demonstrate real, significant, sustained effort to try to move on and try to finish the fight, that's the situation where they could step in and deal with stalling fighters. So whether they're up pressed against the cage, whether they're on the ground, the referee could come in and separate them if they're not following this brand new rule. So here's a copy of it. I'd love to know your thoughts. All right. So again, uh, great breakdowns, kind of snackable videos, uh, very easy to follow and understand. And I like all those changes and the proposed one as well. Uh, the, the sport continues to evolve. It continues to improve. Uh, and as we've talked about, like I throw out things like open scoring and, you know, judging things like that. I, I know that the sport is only 30 years old. The only thing I want is progression, improvement, evolution. It's when the regulators and the commissioners sit and say like, oh, it's all good and we don't need to change anything. That's what pisses me off. But if they're trying to make things better and I would, you know, I would be surprised if anyone thinks that this is making things worse. Uh, that to me is promising and makes me feel like the people in charge, the regulators, the officials are not letting their egos get involved and they are trying to make things better. So this is all very promising to me. Uh, number three, Chase. Hi, Ariel. Is Sean O'Malley receiving the least deserved title shot in the UFC over the last five years? He won an extremely controversial decision against Piotr Jan. Sean has no other ranked wins in the UFC. All of Sean's other wins are fighters that have now been released from the UFC. I mean, I don't know. Uh, he's fought some tough guys and you can't just dismiss the Jan decision. It wasn't a robbery. It was a close fight. Um, you know, we, we've had fighters, especially in some of the lower weight classes, you know, like the Tyler Santos's of the world, like she didn't have any huge, massive number one contender win. Uh, Yuri Prochaska only had a couple of fights in the UFC. So I, I, I don't think that that's necessarily fair. Um, you know, my, my guy, Jamal Hill didn't have a ton of fight. Like there, there have been situations where, fighters have uh gotten opportunities and ran with it and no one's going to turn it down um it's you know it's it's up to the ufc it's up to their discretion to give that opportunity to someone for whatever reason it could be you know they need someone on the card they they have no one else in that particular weight class or the champion i mean sean strickland right uh like what, what's his big signature win he's getting a title shot on uh on on september 9th so i think the Jan one was pretty damn big and you know I don't love the fact that he had to sit for 11 months, but if that was the fight to get him the title shot back in October, like if he was getting one in February, I don't think anyone would have batted an eye. I think it's just the distance in between fights that leaves people, you know, asking questions like this. Um, Stefan, Shalom Ariel, Shalom. First question on the Substack: it pays to sleuth. Thank you. Anything goes, right? If I recall correctly, your deal with MMA fighting after turning heel Wani was for three years, correct? Which means we're almost exactly one year out, correct? In fact, I think the, I think the, the two-year anniversary to the day was today or yesterday or tomorrow. It's like a, one, one of these days because I remember it was like second week of August and then I went to SummerSlam in Vegas and then I came back and then I went to Jake Paul, Tyron Woodley one in Cleveland. So yeah, it's it's... Like we are celebrating essentially the two-year anniversary. How far out do those negotiations typically begin? Will you be testing the waters as you often advise fighters to do? Will you follow in line uh, with your favorite social media platform and become the X hour to become the show for everything? Wow, these are a lot of questions. I mean, uh, a year out is when you start to kind of think about the future, I would say. That's sort of like the signal to start thinking. Um, I would say typically in these things, especially in TV, rare for negotiations of any kind, but it does happen to happen a year out. Typically like eight, six months out is when it gets really fun. Um, I was telling someone recently, I mean, I couldn't be happier with the way things played out post ESPN 
all the gigs, how they all fit in perfectly nice little, you know, puzzle pieces that nothing intertwined, nothing overlapped. No one's feelings got hurt. No one was upset, at least to the best of my knowledge, they may say otherwise. And so I think the return has been great. You know, if we didn't come back, we don't meet GC. We don't meet mysterious Frank. We don't uh, reunite with corporate Alex and Joe. We don't get New York Rick back. I mean, it couldn't have worked out better. We had the show in Dallas uh, just a couple of weeks ago, which was incredible or the shows. So everything has been great. Um, But who knows, you know, they may not want me. They may say hit the road, Jack. Uh, they may say, you know, we're done. I don't know. You know, I've, I've been, uh, I've been surprised before. So let's see. Uh, I, I'm not one who loves change, believe it or not. Like I hate to move. I hate, I actually hate going on vacation. I dread it because of packing. Like I, I, I like routine as Tim and I were speaking about. I like knowing today I'm doing this today. I'm doing that. Even if the weeks are different. And I love the fact that my weeks are always you know, different, every day is different, right? Like Monday, I'm doing this, Tuesday, I'm doing that. Nothing is the same, but I kind of like to know in advance. Um, so it's not like I'm seeking change, but you know, we'll see. The The media business is changing. It's evolving. He does bring up an interesting, you know, comment about the X hour uh, that has been, you know, on my mind as well. I mean, I have a lot of interests just like DJ. So let's see, stay tuned. Watch this space as they say. Um, but I think it's going to be all great things. And thus far, two years in, couldn't be happier. Like there has been, thank God, no misstep, no regret, no frustration. Really, really, really uh, appreciative about how everything turned out. Uh, Nick, gang, Chris Weidman making his comeback fight after that horrific leg break has been the sleeper news of the month so far. Couldn't agree more, Nick. Historically, no one has come back Looking great after such an incident. Corey Hill, rest in peace. Anderson Silva both went on to lose most of their fights after healing back up. Tyrone Spung retired from kickboxing. He's pretty much only boxed since it happened to him in 2014, aside from the Hari Tanov loss in MMA. This is a massive deal, and more people should be talking about it. Couldn't agree more. What's the gang's thoughts on this? P.S. Hope to hear Weidman's dad after the fight, Nick the Dane. I mean, I couldn't agree more. You all know he's one of my favorites covering him when he got into the UFC, even before he got into the UFC, the Sakara fight, the Maya fight, um, you know, the, the, the submission in Vancouver, getting the title shot. And then, you know, hurricane Sandy, all, all that stuff that he's had to deal with the ups and downs. When he broke his leg in Jacksonville, it was one of the most depressing things that I've ever seen covering MMA. I remember going to bed that night, feeling legitimately sad because you get to know these people, you get to know their families, you get to know their wives, you get to know their kids, you get to know their parents. And like, you don't know what's going to happen with a leg break like that. What, what is the worst like amputation? Like uh, you, your mind just, it, it was horrific. It was absolutely horrific. And so to see him come back, I was telling this to someone yesterday. In life, when we go through something traumatic, we try to avoid any which way possible to repeat that traumatic event. Here's Chris Weidman. Here's Anderson. So these, these examples that were mentioned who suffered one of the most traumatic injuries that you could possibly suffer in athletics and did all that they could to just get back there to do the exact same thing, to be in that spot fights about to start to go out there. And as he says, throws a leg kick off the bat. Let's see if he does. That's a different kind of human being. That's a different kind of breed. Um, and so I'm, I'm thrilled for him. I wish him the best. I love the fact that they put him up there against a fellow veteran and not a young gun who's going to try to like wipe the floor with him. Obviously the deck is, is stacked against them. Obviously, historically you don't come back looking the same, but he's a freak athlete. He always has been a very determined person and, and fighter. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just wish him the best. I absolutely do. And, and I think it might be flying under the radar. Like if this was, you know, a fight night or, or, you know, maybe a lesser card, uh, perhaps you would feel like we're talking about it more, should be talking about it more, but with Aljo and Sean and, and some of the big names, Ian Gary doing a good job of getting some attention, maybe it's flying under the radar, but not over here, my friends. I actually thought about asking him to come on. I feel like he's going through enough. I feel like there's probably enough, you know, attention and, and, and media and then, I wanted to let him be in, we'll reconvene in the future, but uh, wishing him the best. And I agree with you, Nick, it, it, it should be getting 
as much attention as anything on the card. Brantley, hey, Ariel, question in relation to Fyodor's interview last week. He mentioned he liked to box Mike Tyson and you started setting up a time slash location. Have you ever gone through behind the scenes and message the promoter to see if it was actually possible or do you just assume that they see it or hear about it from the show and you don't have to do anything? Curious if you ever had a big hand in making a fight happen outside the show. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a couple. Probably the most famous one is uh, Pat Cummins against Daniel Cormier. Daniel Cormier was supposed to fight Rashad Evans. I think it was UFC 270 or something like that. Rashad Evans pulled out like 10 days out. Um, man, what is his name? Uh, oh my God, I can't believe I'm blanking on, on the manager's name now. Nierk Rick is in there, right? What is his That's manager's correct. name? Um, I got to get this. I can't believe I'm blanking here. He was Mayhem's manager. He was he was uh, King Mo's manager. He was Pat Cummings' manager. Someone out there. The wall manager. Oh, my God. How am I blanking on his name? <sighs> anyway, his, it's going to come to me in a second. His manager, uh, Ryan Parsons. There it is. Ryan Parsons. Um, Ryan Parsons called me. And said, like, we need to get Pat Cummins in. He's got a great story. He wrestled Daniel Cormier in college. He made him cry, all that stuff. I called Dana White and said, this guy's been trying to get into the UFC. He's got this great backstory. He made him cry, all that stuff. You need to talk to this guy. He could save the fight. Dana said, give me Ryan Parsons' number. Ryan Parsons got the call. He drove to Starbucks or whatever coffee shop that, 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 Pat Cummins was working at at the time, went through the drive through gave him the phone and, 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 and said, tell Dana the story. Dana wants to know the story. And he told Dana the story and he got the fight that day. And I think either later that day or the next day, they were both on Fox Sports Live talking about the fight. He was not in the UFC. And, you know, I'm just answering the question here. I 1,000% got him in. Also, uh, JDS was looking for a fight. Mark Hunt called me. This was, I think, 246 and said, how do I get the fight? And I, I called Dana and I said, Mark Hunt's looking for a fight and uh, wants this one. And he's like, does he really want it? Do we have to go through this guy? That guy's like, no. He says, deal with him directly. He wants the JDS fight. And he got the JDS fight. So yes, there have been times. And if I'm being honest, I feel like I should start writing these, downs, these down because I know there's been some others and I'm starting to you know get old and forget things. But those are probably the, the two biggest ones that I feel like I directly had a hand in uh in making and there's been other times here or there where you're asked to oh do you have this guy's phone number do you have that guy's phone number and i guess there's some person out there who would say like you shouldn't do that but like what do i care if, if it can help someone out um you know why the hell not makes for a good story we're all trying to get by so yeah there you go hello hello uh who do you think leaves ufc first in their current role Dana, Buffer, Rogan, or Anik? How would you rank them in order of biggest impact that would be felt by their absence? I mean, golly. Um, who do I think leaves first? I mean, I guess you would have to say Rogan just because like, he's the closest one to being out. Like, He went from doing every show to just doing the pay-per-views. Um, so I would probably say Rogan and then Dana. I mean, I don't see Buffer and Anik leaving anytime soon. Buffer may be the last one to leave. He just loves this so much. I mean, I could see Anna getting another job doing some other sport, um, but I think he loves it as well. Rogan just continues to get bigger and bigger, and then maybe at one point says, no mas, but I think he just loves this. I mean, I'm certain he doesn't do it for the money. I think he just enjoys... He's got a great gig. I mean, he just shows up for the 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 local, you know, non-international domestic pay-per-views. You get to do the biggest fights, the biggest cards once a month, in the United States, you're Gucci. So that's that's how I would rank them personally. But I don't see any of them leaving anytime soon because I think they love it immensely. Uh, P the G. Ariel, what in the world is going on with this whole first Cameroonian fighter in UFC history situation Saturday night? Are you pretending fighters who choose free agency don't exist anymore? Wild state of affairs. Love to hear your thoughts. I mean, look, I would like to chalk this up to a human error uh are they going to apologize for it i doubt it but you know there's there's actual human beings in those trucks that do these things and it's very possible that some 
graphics person screwed this up. I would hate to think, as you're looking at it right now, this is from Saturday's card. I would hate to think that someone is trying to take a shot at not only Francis Ngannou, but the actual first Cameroonian fighter in UFC history, which was Ramotieri Sokuju, who had a great run in Pride and then uh, a run in the UFC as well. Francis Ngannou commented on this with the photo of him holding the Cameroonian flag. And obviously he himself showed love to Ramo Thierry Sokuju. There he is right over there. Uh, legendary mass that he used to come out to. Great moments in his career. Most notably, the little nog knockout. Uh, I would like to think that no one is asking the production staff and the, the lower thirds operator, graphics operator, to take shots at the likes of Francis and Sokuju. I can't imagine why there would be any beef with Sokuju feels like it's a, a France thing. So I'm actually going to say that this was human error. Now, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I really like, there, there's a part of me that feels like these things get blown out of proportion. And I can understand if I'm Francis or so could you, you'd be offended by that. But I, I, I'm not a conspiracy guy. And I like to think the best out of people in these situations. And I think sometimes people think that it's Dana White literally in the truck making these calls. Couldn't be further from the truth. Um, so let's, can we chalk this one up to a mistake? I mean, the timing is definitely a little bit strange, but why would they do this? Like, well, what's the point? What's the upside here? Well, like, you can't pretend like these guys don't exist, especially Francis heavyweight champion feels like a, a mistake. GC, do you agree with me? Or do you think there's more to this? Are you a little bit more cynical than I am? Uh, man, it's, it's kind of weird like that. It happens to be surrounding Francis and Gano, but. I, I don't know, man. I mean, someone is typing that in. Like, someone had to have been like, uh, wasn't Francis Ngannou Cameroonian? Yeah, but I mean, you've you've worked in these situations, and yeah, I guess you just like, I guess you just mess up. But like, if that's going to be your fighter fact, wouldn't you wouldn't you double check that? Yeah, no, you should. I've made check. issues. I, I've made I've made plenty of mistakes on graphics. This is a fairly big one, though. I suppose this is a massive one, and the timing is very unfortunate. It's very odd. And the fighter it's surrounding is also very odd. I wonder, by the way, what the process is. Like when you're putting up a fun fact like that, there has to be some sort of like fact checking process. So what are they going through? Like what is the person who's in charge of that? By the way, correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't your girlfriend have a similar job? Yes. Yeah, she works at ESPN. In, in that, but that capacity, like, do you have to go to? Because yeah, like, I know at ESPN there's like stats and info group, right? And so you send them. That's what I would see. I would see this. Like, you would send them. Is this correct? I don't know if the UFC has that. You know what I mean? So if like, I, I would see people all the time sending that like Slack channel, the stats and info channel, being like, "Is it right that Russell Westbrook has the most?" You know what I mean? So that you don't get these things wrong. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's just some guy in a truck doing this. There this. also had to have been more than one person's eyes on this. There's absolutely no way that just someone made it and then just fired it off, and that's that's all it was. I, like, I, feel, I don't know. You, <laughs> you, I don't you, know, man. You think so? I mean, dude, we by the time a lower third for us goes up, and theirs <laughs> is way more important than ours. I there know. has been yeah. like five sets of eyes that so you, have looked. So at you're them. you're leaning you're leaning towards what you're leaning towards. This is a subtle shot. They're just trying to erase him from the history book. Yeah, but then at the same time, who would have who would have been like put that he's the only Cameroonian fighter in all time? Like who who would who would and go other out of their way than to say Dana that? White? Like, who who ultimately that? has a beef with Francis Ngannou there no. in the truck? Like why would they care? They're just people trying to do a job. I I think it was a. Every time I'm about to say that I think it was a mistake, I'm also like, man, how do you make this mistake? Like, how do you yeah. make this mistake? This is just such a ridiculously big mistake. And it got thousands, hundreds of thousands of eyes on it, I like know. after after Ngannou tweeted about it. It is, it is, uh, yeah, the timing is unfortunate. It's dicey. It's suspect? Dicey. Suspect? It's definitely it's sus, bro. It's definitely it's sus. It is tough. Whoever uh, the graphic I'm, guy is, whoever makes the oh third, it's God. definitely tough. I know he did not have a good afternoon on... Uh, on Saturday. No. Uh, Gary G. Greetings, Ariel. My question is, do you have any insight on the Derek Lewis situation? Did the PFL get a chance to approach the Black Beast? I'm assuming the UFC threw a bag of money at him before PFL got a chance. I'm also wondering... Okay, so let me just answer this. Uh, no, because there's always an exclusive negotiation period, so you can't get to the fighter. And as he said at the post-fight press conference in Utah, he wanted to stay, and they gave him a deal that 
kept him happy. And so he's sticking around. I think it's an eight fight deal, which ensures he ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, good for Derek. He seems very happy. Try to get Derek on the show. He doesn't want to do a lot of media these days and, and more power to him. Love Derek. will always love Derek has been nothing but good to me. Um, happy for him. And yeah, he didn't want to leave. He didn't want to leave. Um, you know, I'm sure they're they're treating him well as they should because he's a big star and he got the Manscaped deal too. Shout out to him. That commercial was great, um, but no, no one else got to him because of that exclusive negotiation period. Um, I'm also wondering, Gary continues, if you've heard anything on Brian Ortega. It's been over a year now, and it doesn't seem like he's fight ready. I was there live on Long Island for his last fight. I didn't anticipate this long of an injury hiatus. Ten seven, Gary G. No update on Brian Ortega. Um, See him out there. Seems like he's training. Seems like he's healthy. Doesn't seem like he's still battling the injury, but is he fight ready? You know, is he training camp ready? TBD. So yeah, crazy that that was over a year ago and uh, not much since. Still one of the most popular fighters in that division, but yeah, not much since. And uh, I don't have anything concrete to share. Max83, Guten Tag, Ariel. Yes, Guten Tag and... Uh, congratulations to all the German fans out there who uh, are happy about Harry Kane joining Bayern Munich. I just saw his first interview with Sky Sports this morning. Didn't offer much. Still quite weird to see him in that jersey. But uh, anyway, that's the business of sports. Any update, by the way, on the UEFA Super Cup, GC? I, I understand Man City is playing Sevilla this evening uh, over there. Any updates on that? Yeah, actually, at the half, Sevilla leads 1-0. Wow. Yeah. Tough sledding these days for Man City. Of course, KDB out. Uh, I don't know if you yeah. saw that yeah. big injury. Um, wow, that is that is surprising. Yeah. My, I mean, my, my son's probably in tatters right now. They got to focus on uh, Newcastle on Saturday. That's right. Oh, uh, my gosh. My girlfriend is actually watching. She weighed in on the Nganu thing. Oh, wow. She says there Expert was... Expert un- analysis. Okay, she says ahead. there was undoubtedly multiple eyes on it, but she doesn't believe that it uh, was malicious. She thinks it would just be highly unprofessional if there was malicious intent behind it. <laughs> See, that's what I think as well. But that is crazy. Multiple eyes missed that. Like when you have a stat, and thank you to her for that. I appreciate it. If you have a stat like that first, that's a very like Googleable thing to look. Is that the word? Uh, Goog- like Googleable thing. Googleable, right? Googleable. How is no one uh, checking that? Also, like, if we can go back to the picture right quick of it, it's also like it's the highlighted thing too. Like, it's like it <laughs> sticks out with the white font. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, it, okay. Is it bad. possible, by the way? Okay, now that I look at this again, is it possible that they meant to say only Cameroonian fighter in the UFC, and someone the, fucked it up and turned it into UFC history? history? Absolutely, yeah. On the UFC roster, like. Uh, it yes, also it also that's is, what I feel like it also happened. is weird to say it like instead of being like first Cameroonian fighter in UFC history, only Cameroonian fighter in UFC history sounds just sounds very weird. That actually makes it sound malicious. Only Cameroonian yes. fighter <laughs> on the UFC oh. roster sounds like what they meant to put, and there was a uh, yes a complication in communication. <laughs> I feel for that person, by the way, like the moment where you see your work is like, you're, you're a graphics person like that. You don't want to go viral. You don't want to fuck up and all eyes will be on you in that truck. Cause I think it got out, right? Like it got out mid event. Oh yeah. No doubt. No doubt. No, 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 no. People notice it instantaneously. Like it was immediate. People notice it. And I know whoever was the final person, whoever typed that in their stomach their dropped. heart probably like, went they, all the way to their ankles. Yes, I have to yes. Their, the their ass fell out, for sure. What is it? Oh, for someone it? wants to break well, the fourth wall? Who's when that? When we were in Dallas, there was a graphics op, and Mike Heck got on the stage with you, and the guy taps me on the shoulder. He's like, who is that? And I was like, oh, he's an employee of ours. And then he taps me again, and there's a lower third on his screen. It says Mike Heck, a MMA Hour employee. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not his title. <laughs> But just uh, to think that this is the same thing. Like, who is that guy? Oh, he's a Cameroonian fighter. Like, oh, let me type out that he's the first one in UFC history. Oh, man, but they are not doing these on the fly. These have been finalized days in advance, I, I can be sure of. I mean... Oh, that for sure. The the, <laughs> the freak out that that person... It, like, gives me nightmares, the freak out that that person must have had. I feel anxiety just thinking about the scenario where that person realizes that they just really oh, yeah. fucked up. Especially, it's not just saying, like... Oh, only Iranian fighter. Like, there's no. T- it's tied to like one of the biggest stories of the last 
year in the UFC. It just so happened to be yeah. that Francis is from Cameroon, and you know that this is going to be made out to be a massive deal. Like if you would have said like only Danish fighter in UFC history, definitely insulting to Mark Madsen and Martin Kampman and all these guys. But there's no controversy attached to Danish fighters right now. It happened to be Cameroon that you messed up on. Golly. My girlfriend chimes good. in one more time. Oh, yes, please. She said, if I was on the crew that it happened to, I can guarantee you there would be a big talking to afterward from the higher producers. Do you think dismissal? Do you think? Do you I don't think, think dismissal, but I think, I think someone got a serious, serious talking to. My, my biggest mistake I've ever made in production, uh, we were doing a live broadcast for a Yankees game. I feel like I've told this before, but we got Aaron Judge, and we got, oh. like, ha- we got like halfway through the interview. Aaron Judge, obviously a big name, doesn't have a lot of time. Uh, we got Aaron Judge on the broadcast, uh, and it was a taped interview. We got halfway through it, and I realized I, I was not recording. And ah. my stomach. I was like, I had the biggest internal freak out. Had to tell everyone. <laughs> they had to tell Aaron. They were like, oh, yeah, Aaron, our board op didn't start the recording, so uh, we're just going to have to re-rack this. And he's like, uh, all right. Uh, I guess that, like you could just tell he was annoyed. It was like, oh, man, my, Who my was the face reporter? was definitely red. Or who was the host? I'm trying to remember who. Because uh, that person is probably more annoyed than Aaron Judge. Like, Aaron Judge is like, whatever, I'm just going to give you candy. Oh, the, produ- the producers and the and the host, yeah, they talked to yeah. me pretty seriously afterward. Uh, and it was, like, fire- the biggest, like, I was so guilty. Like, I was, like, so, like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so I'm sure whoever did this felt terrible. But what, you didn't get fired. Look at this. My face is getting red right now just I know, talking I know, about I it. That's how embarrassed I was. Uh, no, I did not get fired. No. All right. Now, by the way, did you consider just recording midway interview and yeah. then just saying, like, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I pressed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I considered a lot of things. And then I was just like, okay. this is Aaron Judge. Like, I, I have to come clean on what happened. If it was yeah, like, did you, if it was, you know, Ariel Hawani MMA, you know, ESPN MMA journalist, I would have been like, sure, hey, you know, sure, we, missed, sure. we missed the starting of the recording. But yeah, NBD. It was, it was nightmare scenario. Now, now, did you alert them mid interview or did you wait for the interview to end? Not mid interview because I was like, we have to stop. We have to we have to Fuck. shut it down and restart it. Uh, <laughs> you were so bad. Uh, she, it was by the so way, bad. even hearing someone in your position saying we have to stop makes me feel sick to my stomach. That's the worst. You're in an interview and like, yeah, yeah, uh, we didn't catch that or uh, what? I have to fake this now. I was I doing know. a real sports story yesterday, uh, which I'll be very excited to share with all of you in the very near future. And there was one point where we had like a great answer, and then they said they didn't catch it because a freaking uh. plane was over the. Uh, <laughs> spot that we were standing I was like oh, uh, I have to ask it's just like you can't recreate that no, nowhere near as bad as as your blunder though but oh so bad still, so bad yeah. all right well thanks for that great insight uh from the truck we could have a whole new segment tales from the truck uh it is very I had to sit in the truck a couple times and uh I don't I don't I don't envy people who have to sit in trucks I mean it's a tough job there's a lot of stress you got people screaming yelling f bombs all over the place there's no daylight you're like you're, usually trucks, for those that haven't been there, they're very tight. There's not a lot of space. You're in there for hours, and you walk outside, and like the sun hits you, and you're like, ah, the outdoors. It's a tough gig. It's not fun. Everyone thinks it's glamorous that you get to go to all these events, but then you make a mistake like that, and everyone hates you. It's no fun. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, back to Max from Germany, I do believe. Yes. Uh, I know you and Connor share a strong history together, but I am slash was a big fan of his back in the day. Nowadays, I'm basically just concerned about him as a human being. All of his appearances are just weird to me. Do you really believe that he's coming back in December, as he said? I think the ship has sailed, and we maybe don't see him ever again. P.S. We need Don Fry. Greetings from Germany, my man. Uh, And uh, moderator Lewis, who, as always, does a great job, tells me that uh, this particular individual continues to ask for Don Fry. We'll get him. I mean, I don't think it's too hard to get Don. Legend. The Predator. Um... I think Connor fights again. Do I think December is possibly not going to happen? Absolutely. But I do think he fights again. It's a weird thing going on now with Connor and Michael Chandler because the Ultimate Fighter just wrapped up. And like you could see Chandler is trying to bait him into a fight and to get his, his interest peaked with the small hands, with the he's not going to do this and that. And I, I don't know if it's working necessarily on Connor. But as I said last week, I think the fight to make is Connor versus Chandler, if only because Chandler was promised the fight. And I know the fight game is full of empty promises, but 
it would be kind of shitty if he went in and fought someone else. He could definitely do that. Justin Gaethje, Nathan Diaz. But yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I believe GC was the one that sent this, the clip of the, the time that I was at the Black Forge Inn in May for the Katie Taylor fight when he was holding court back there. And he said at the end of the Ultimate Fighter, they would have the date for the fans of when he uh, would fight Michael Chandler. And yesterday was the last episode of the Ultimate Fighter. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, GC, they did not have a date, right? Nope. No, no, no. We had, how, we did had they, f- how did they address it? Uh, Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler will meet in the octagon at some point down the road. Uh, something, right. something like that. Like uh, a much anticipated contest in the octagon awaits. Uh, it sounded like for a, v- a very brief moment at the end, uh, as they were finishing things up, they like talked about 292 and like how the finales are going to be on it. And then they talked about Chandler and McGregor and like it sounded like they might be like, they're going to fight. And then they dropped the like, at some point. Didn't yeah, it's a weird date. one. I think December might be, I mean, they don't really need a big fight for December. They certainly don't need one for November. And there's a chance that Leon and Colby fight on that card. And then you may have Yuri and, and Alex in December. And so like, what I would do is just kind of save them for 298 or 299 and just have two massive shows back to back. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a weird one. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know like how many times he's going to fight, but I, I feel confident saying he's going to fight again. That's, that's, that's how I feel at the moment. Do you feel otherwise? Nah, I, I'm with you on that. Some point early next year. Why does he do those videos where he's wearing the, like the speedos and then <laughs> <laughs> we got another one this morning. Yeah, I, saw I don't know if we ever talked those. about it. On, I mean, there's a, uh, Anytime there's a McGregor pose, you know you're in for it when you get the when you get the blue box and it's just the audio. The blue, like, he's the, blue, the only one that still uses the audio function. I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone else do it. You know you're in no. for a good time when you see the blue audio box. <laughs> the yacht videos are, I mean, the one last week of him yelling at the Fertitta's yeah. yachts, I've probably yeah. watched like 150 times. Uh, just, just get some work crazy. in, lads. Be over shortly. <laughs> It's best part. It's so good. Oh my gosh! Uh, overall, what what score would you give out of ten? T- your first tough. season of the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, we're we're grading this on like comparing it to other reality shows. Just, I think your your I think your expectations were high. I think you were excited about it. Expectations were way too it? high. Way yeah. my expectations were here. They should have been much closer to here. Entertainment value. You know how captivating it was, how interested you were in it. I I was interested in it, and it kept my interest throughout. But I was also, you know, I I got to get on the show Tough Hang afterward and like talk about it uh, with AK Lee and, and Casey Lydon. So like I think that helped. Like if I if I was not doing that show. I don't know if I would have made it through the entire season, like watching every episode every week. I feel like I would have just been checking in more. I mean, the internet, the entertainment value, like when it comes to like an, an actual reality show itself, it was not good. Like if I'm, if I'm stacking this up against like a survivor, or like any of like the big name reality shows, like it's the challenge. I know Rick is here. I know he loves the challenge. Uh, like, I mean, I'm giving it like a D plus a C minus. It's, wow. it's so formulaic. It's just like there's nothing really this, that draws you in. There's no drama. There's no anything. I love the fact that you're calling it formulaic and you're right in doing so. And and you didn't watch the previous 29 or whatever seasons. <laughs> 30, it's the previous the exact same. Yeah, yes, 31. it's been the exact same thing. We don't get it's any insane. drama until the very last episode. Then we find out Cody it, Gibson and Brad Katona hate each other. And I'm like, where was wow. any of this the entire season? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll say it. one one asterisk to the it's the same every time they did try that live season, which I thought, you know, good yeah. effort at least to try and like switch it up. I don't know if, you know, ultimately that was super successful. It, it created much. some good talent. Um, but yeah, Whatever. we I get mean, contender series. That's much live. The and also <laughs> it was almost it was almost inhumane. They made them stay in the house for 13 yes. freaking weeks. It was absurd. Yeah. yeah, I if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was Aaron McKenzie who was on Team McGregor. He's been tweeting. Uh, a decent amount about like how 
yeah, I believe it was Aaron McKenzie about how negative of an experience the entire thing was. Oh, for it's him. brutal. Like six he, he, weeks, can't talk to your family. Yeah, he lost and he lost pretty early on, and like having to hang out for however many weeks, and like I, I don't really know how you fill the time from that point. Um, so yeah, I mean, I also I feel like, like if you lose, you got to leave. That's that's there, how it. There's been be. times though where those people step in. If there's injuries, true. So I, I no, think there's a back, there's a though. reason to be around put, and put stay them in another house. Ready. Put them in another house where they have access to phones and stuff like that. And if you need them, they have to come back. Could in, do. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And like, but the, then if they come back, people are going to be like, "Oh, they got to do that," and there's going to be whining and griping about the, that. The vets, eh, the vets versus prospects thing was like ended up being like pretty dumb, especially because like some of the prospects were like 36. It, it should have just been was in the UFC, like UFC veteran versus. The potential of prospect, and it was also kind of a mismatch. Like we got no prospects in the in the finales on Saturday. We only really got one that even won, Enrico DeShula. Um, so like it was it was kind of one way traffic for Team Chandler the whole way. Like we didn't even get. Here, to see, Here's the like, bottom line: the uh, ultimate. Sorry for interrupting, but the no, ultimate no, like the ultimate like hook that this show had was that you know we got exposed to some great young fighters, some future superstars, some future title contenders, some future champions. Those don't exist anymore. If anything, they're just getting signed outright or they're going on contender series. You know what I mean? Like yesterday, I know he didn't win, but like George Hardwick, there was a lot of excitement about him fighting. And so he's going on contender series. He's the cage warriors champion. He's not going on the ultimate fighter. And so like, if you don't have that anymore, what do you have? You know what I mean? What do you have? You don't have much. By the you way, got weeks of programming to... for ESPN Plus, which is all the only. Thing I know, but they and how did it do? How did it do? Yeah, I can't, I can't That's imagine. That's a great question. Great, and they they did as as big as big gets uh, with with McGregor bringing McGregor in to go against uh, Chandler. Uh, one question that is posed: uh, Brad Katona in the finale on Saturday, uh, trying to become a two time Ultimate Fighter champion. Is he the ultimate, ultimate fighter, or is he the ultimate fighter? That's been a big topic of debate. Oh, wow. Ultimate fighter is nice. strong. Oh, Macha's hello. Look at Macha at the, in the oh, building. She's just chilling at the front door crying. Uh, she won't time. look at the camera? Like, hey, come the on. The whole come family. There left. she goes. She must have heard there me. There she is. Machi, why are you crying? No one's here in the house, and she's crying at the door. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> she's sweating, actually. I think she's nervous that everyone left her. Machi, yeah. what's your problem? Why are you being so shy all of a sudden? Oh, look at that. We've come a long way. <laughs> We've come a long way. Machi, why? What's the problem, Machi? Why are you crying? You have to talk in that voice, you know? Oh, of course. Anyway, yeah, yeah. You got to have the dog done, voice. Right? The dog voice is great. Machi, what's your problem? Why are you being so coy? Are you a You're dog thinking... hater, Rick? I'm not a dog hater, but like I could sit out the, that moment. Like let, let you have that. You know what oh. I mean? <laughs> What's better than this? The, vo the like, voice and, and you don't the whole like the thing. voice, bro. I, I could, you don't like the dog talk. I could sit that out if I'm being honest. I get honest. home, my God. my tiny pint sized dog runs up to me. I give him, you know, what's up, big man? You gotta you gotta give the dog the voice, man. Come on, you I'm ever with, think you'd see I'm this? With Eric, Rick. You never thought you'd see this? No, me. no, definitely not. Especially because oh. I know the story of how it how much I came to and the feelings initially. So yeah, no, I do not. I did not see this coming. But I am happy. I mean, it, clearly, this this is part of the family. So yeah, I'm very oh, happy my for God. you. We're, she sees the the the, the luggage. <laughs> She's getting all worried about it. Oh, my poor Machi. Oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you hate the dog voice, Rick. I mean, that just comes with having a dog. It's just part. You know, it's it's part of the whole fun. By the way, you come yes. home, no one that, wants to talk to me anymore except for, um, for, for Macha. She's the only one. No, I'm all for you having that. I don't need to be party to you <sighs> having that. You can have that. You know? Like, that's that's for you guys. Machi's trying to tell me something right now. Let me just kick her out. Sorry, guys. Machi, you got to go out. All right, so you decided uh, I like on... I like Multimate. I like Multimate for what it's worth. I think that's pretty clever. I think I'm an ultimate, ultimate fighter. Guy. Oh, Chris Weidman, there he is. Uh, shout out to Chris. <laughs> yeah, we just and to, and to John Galang. Uh, yes, they left shout me out alone. To John Galang, beast. Um, all right, let's get to the. Uh, oh, like, wait, just... hey, before before we get to the last question, we we oh, were no. just posing a question. Brad Katona trying to become the first uh, two time ultimate fighter champion, and the question is posed: ultimate fighter or the ultimate ultimate fighter? I think you gotta go ultimate ultimate. Oh wow! What, the, why would you're you the deciding vote, Connor? What, which is it? 
I, I've been backing Ultimate Ultimate Fighter the, the whole season, so I'll stick with it. Because I'm All not right, going to lie. I'm not voted. When he said it on the show, he was like, is it – he – Brad Katona asked the question. He said Ultimate Fighter, and, like, for the first three or four seconds, I was like, what does he mean by that? Maybe I'm just slow, but, uh, but yeah, I didn't – Ultimate Ultimate, compl- you know, immediately clicked. I like that champ. Yeah, champ, it's like double ultimate. champ versus champ champ. You get the you right. get the there you go. different flavors. He's on flavors. Team McGregor too, so he will be a double champ. Are they going to bring both the trophies out for him if he wins on Saturday? Big no, it's like a glass. Team. It's usually like some yeah. kind of like weird that's, glass configuration thing. I know that's I what I'm saying. Know. Like, is he going to be holding both the glass configurations <laughs> up against his shoulder? <laughs> I hope not. The ultimate ultimate. Champ, uh, they, they forgot you know, to bring out the second belt for Connor yeah, when he wanted MSG. Yeah. They're definitely not the bringing ultimate, out the ultimate second fighter class. doesn't apologize to anyone. Yeah. All right, that's enough tough talk. Um, no soup for you. Hello, lads. No soup is back with a juicy question. Enough of these softballs for Ariel. Ariel, what's going on with Frankie Edgar? Did he really not talk to you because of Ali, and is that why he's barely been mentioned by you since? Something must have happened behind the scenes. You'd love to have the legends like Paul Veron, which is great, but not a peep about Frankie since he retired. I don't think that's fair or accurate. I did talk a lot about Frankie uh, going into that last fight, spoke about it after. I mean, he hasn't really done anything to talk about on this show since. But yes, to answer your question, he did stop coming on because of Ali. Uh, I knew Frankie before he knew Ali, and I'm not, I don't want, the last thing I want is to get into any type of feud with Frankie Edgar. I was a little bit bummed that that happened. Um, but, you know... Ali makes some money and he's he's got a side with this guy. I get it. Who the hell am I? We had great interviews. Uh, I feel like I covered him really fairly and and in a fun way. The pizza thing with Mark Henry. Uh, still maintain a great relationship with Mark Henry and even with Frankie. I texted him before the fight, after the fight. Uh, no hard feelings. You know, it's all very stupid and unfortunate. All this stuff and uh, I wish you know I wish it didn't happen. Four years plus now. I don't even understand why it's a thing. Uh, I don't even think he understands why it's a thing, Ali, that is. Um, but yeah, I mean, what would you want me to say about him in the last eight, nine, ten months? We we definitely talked about him going into the MSG fight and after the MSG fight. What more is there to say? I would have loved to have him on before or after. I'd love to have him on tomorrow. But uh, can't do it. So what, what do you want me to do? I don't know what, what else there is to say. Not my call. I saw him once in a uh, airport in the midst of all of this, and it was it was totally fine. If I saw him today, it'd be totally fine too. He he's 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 showing loyalty to his guy. He's following his guy's, um, you know, advice if you want to call it that, request. And you know, I I can't I can't fault that. You know, I wish I wish the guy would drop it, but. Uh, I don't think he is anytime soon, and I don't think we have been as affected as he suspected we would be. Uh, Aaron. Hey, Ariel. As an interviewer, we often face the challenge of needing to ask questions that push or challenge our guests. For example, it's clear that asking fighters that uh, about pay can be a tough topic to discuss, but is relevant to the business of MMA. You've demonstrated a remarkable skill, thank you, in acknowledging the difficulty of certain questions while maintaining a respectful approach. Can you share your perspective on crafting engaging questions and how to be both a strong and considerate interviewer? I truly appreciate your time, insights, and all the energy you give to the sport. Shout out to Aaron Pete. He's very positive and very kind on social media. We, we tend to talk about the negativity and, and the haters and stuff like that, but I see his comments and his tweets and uh, I appreciate them very much. So much love and, and, and shout out to him as well. Used an interesting word there, crafting engaging questions. Um, as I've said before, I don't write my questions in advance, even if it's you know if it's for this show, if it's for a two hour real sports interview, if it's about something I'm completely you know foreign to, if it's for the basketball interviews, wrestling, those sit downs, the BT ones, TNT. Now I, I just don't like writing them. Do I want to ask certain things? Do I want to you know inquire about certain things? Yes. Um, and the best way to navigate those waters, in my opinion, are to just ask those hard questions in a respectful way. I know that's very easy to say, but like in a soft, respectful, approachable, comforting way. Uh, if you just start out saying like, hey, why did you do this? Or hey, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I hate the talk about question. That's the worst. Talk about this. Your thoughts on this? Um, 
you know, have I made these mistakes in the thousands of hours that we've done? Most likely, but the best is when you can just, you know, that's why I've always tried to speak in a kind of like soft, calm way. You want this to feel relaxed. You want this to feel, you know, um, down to earth. It's just two friends chatting and, and you ultimately don't want it to feel like an interview. And that's what I hope, you know, like oh, the greatest compliment that I would always hear people say about Howard Stern is like, they get in that chair, they're sitting there and they forget they're doing a show. And so I, I always hope that that is the feeling. Um, you always try to make that, you know, the, uh, the, the, like the, 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 the end game and have them say like, wow, I can't believe we spoke about that. Cause I wasn't really thinking about interview consequence, this and that, just like, we're just, we're just talking. Um, and that's not me trying to trick them or be sly or anything like that. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to ask, uh, questions and get answers to things that people want to know about these people. Uh, the good, sometimes the bad, sometimes the ugly. I'm not shooting for any of that. Um, that's the thing that I never understood about the instigating thing. It's like, oh, well, of course, like if you're just going to ask positive, 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 fluffy questions all the time, there'll be no sort of, you know, drama or anything like that. But like, that's part of the job. The job is to ask about certain things, but to do it in the most respectful and appropriate way possible. And I've tried to do that throughout my career. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you fail. Sometimes people think that you're asking things with bad intentions. Sometimes people don't really understand why you're asking things. Sometimes people misconstrue questions. Uh, this is all going to happen. It has happened. It will happen. It will probably happen down the line as well. Um, and that's just part of the gig. And you hope that you have enough you know, credibility and history and connections and, and, and body of work to suggest that like, you're not trying, I couldn't care again, as I've said a thousand times, I couldn't care less if, if a video gets X amount of views versus it. I, I don't, I don't profit off of any of that. So like, I have no real, I'm not pushing for any of that. I'm trying like the DJ conversation is the exact thing that I would point to. I didn't think that we would talk about the stuff on the back end. It just kind of flowed. I had nothing written. I had no real direction. And, and we went an hour and I was like, holy shit, I've kept him for too long. Petrosky as well. Like I knew a little bit about his story, but that, that to me is the best part of the job. Um, and the best part of interviewing period. Like when you just, like I said, I, I've been working on this real sports story and I'm so enamored with the subject because I keep learning more about this individual and I'm just blown away by the way he lives his life and the way he thinks about things. And I'm like, why? Well, I just, I just can't, I can't get enough. I just want to keep asking more and more questions. I could sit there for three hours. What about this? And how do you deal with that? Cause I want to get better too, as a human being, but I want people to learn, um, about these people. And, and that's what I feel like the job of the interviewer is. So again, people may have, uh, different interpretations of what, you know, your intentions are. I could tell you from the heart here, you know, I don't, I don't have any sort of agenda. I don't have any sort of malicious intent. I'm just trying to talk to interesting people and get, you know, get their story out there, the good, the bad, the ugly, and have you judge whether or not you like them. Uh, you know, I, I can have my feelings internally, but ultimately it's not really my call here. Um, and that's why I'll have people from all walks of life on the show and, and, and try not to even shy away and try to steer towards people that I know have different you know, um, different ways of life and line of thinking than I have, because I think those are the most interesting people to talk to. Uh, if you're just surrounding yourself with the same like-minded people, it's not that fun. It's not that interesting. You don't learn anything. There's nothing to really pry about. You're just talking to yourself. There's nothing to really ask. There's nothing to really investigate. There's nothing to really follow up on. Uh, it's the different people, the new people, the the unique ones that are the most fun and, and challenging to, to speak to. And I enjoy those challenges very much. So I don't know. Uh, I guess that that would be my answer, but, uh, but I would ultimately say like, I sometimes watch these interviews and they're so stiff and formal and, and, and that doesn't make the subject comfortable. So ultimately what I think you need to remember is like, being relaxed, being comfortable, being conversational will get people to feel that same way and ultimately open up. All right, great stuff. Great questions, appreciate all of them. Appreciate moderator Lewis as well for uh, compiling them. Uh, that's it for me guys, um, but 
back on Monday, of course, post pay-per-view Monday, couldn't miss it. As we've been teasing, we've got the boys leading the way. We've got New York Rick and GC. It's the, uh, it's, 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 I don't know what it's called. It's the GC and Rick show. It's the Rick and GC show. It's the New York and Georgia show. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. Do we have any more details that we can share or we're still keeping it? We're keeping it. I think we've got to keep it under wraps. All right. right, Yeah. We got to keep it under wraps. It's just you got to be there. Surprise. Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Exactly. Yeah, we got to keep it under wraps. So, like, we, if we give it away, then no one will show up. So we have to point? we have to leave some something for surprise so they'll at least show up. Maybe some special so, guests. Maybe not. Uh, I can't Who wait. knows? I can't wait to tune Who in. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe I don't know. If you if you can carve out some time for me, maybe I pop in. You know. Maybe uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. I mean, send me the Zoom link. You know. And maybe I'll hit me up with your your booking producer. Um, We'll find out in the studio, out of the studio, you know, in the control room, out of the control room, I don't, you know, like, but I from don't know home. what's going to happen from I like home. That idea. Does I like that, that idea. I have to ask you here, here, now it's your moment. Does, how weird does that feel? You have no control over this. We, we could go on air the MMA hour with Ariel Hawani graphics roll out and we could do anything. How do you feel about this? First of all, I would say, I don't know if there's anything on this planet right now that gets me more excited than that notion right there. I don't have to book a show on Monday. I mean, are you kidding me? This is a gift from the heavens. Number one, uh, as you know, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't pass the baton very easily. Uh, you will now have the distinction of doing it twice GC first time. I don't think there's any two people that I would trust with that show. I would either just decide not to do the show. We shut it down for the day or whatever. Uh, but I feel like we're in very capable hands and it's actually exciting to be excited for my show as a fan. You're a fan like, I'm looking of your own shovel for this week and hearing the insights, downloading it, watching it, all that stuff and more uh, as a fan, just tuning in myself. I think it's going to well, be Well, we're fantastic. excited to have you as a fan. Um, it's going to be a great show. I hope you guys get what? 35,000 live concurrents smash our francis that feels Nani low show, which i think is the uh yeah no why not okay. when they when they know when they know what guests we're gonna have you'll you're gonna get aljo 50. and sugar sean in studio together 48 hours removed from Book their the rematch title live play. on the show <laughs> i'm already i'm already getting the bradley martin response to dj we're gonna oh we're gonna break. my god we're gonna push yourself. the desk out of the way we're it. gonna have bradley and dj roll DJ was like, I don't want to complicate <laughs> oh things. All right, we won't complicate things. Let's do it right We've here. got Zuck and Musk wow. in talks. Not that. yet. Live not confirmed off. yet. Live in talks. talks. For, in the in works? Talks. Efforting? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, had to, Mark I had to remake Green. a Facebook. Mark, um, you know, the bubble. He, he, the bubbles are popping up with Mark, so it's not 100% okay. yet. Oh, we'll, yeah, yeah, once, yeah, yeah. once we clear the bubbles, then we'll we'll see what happens. By the way, your level of interest in DJ versus Bradley Martin, you're correct? I mean, based on how DJ's laid it out, like he just wants to like prove something. It's not gonna like it, I'm not expecting like this to be Bradley Martin is actually trying to rip his head off and DJ's trying to like take his arm home or his neck. Um, so not as much. It feels like it's a little too cordial. You know what 12. I mean? I I need some animus in my fight. I need to I I need there to be a reason that they're fighting rather than just like. Hey, I want to show that little guys can fight. Like I know DJ can fight. I don't need to. I don't need to see that. I know he would twist Bradley Martin into a pretzel. Don't 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 need it to be seen. Twelve out of ten. I I want to see the visual. You're of, into a twelve out of ten. Of someone of someone a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier, as Rick put it, getting twisted you, like a pretzel. You you can watch some like ADCC like open weight stuff, yeah. and you'll see it. You'll see lightweights I I see and heavyweights. And Bradley Martin do it though. Wow, why, why? Could you imagine the about- visual? He was like, "Yeah, I could pick him up and drop, like, like put him down, take him down." Could you imagine DJ just body slamming Bradley Martin? That would be insane. I can. Why are we hearing so much about Bradley Martin all of a sudden? Is it just because of this gimmick where he's challenging all these fighters? I mean, he has a ton of followers. Like, he's he does. He's yeah. Is this uh, show good? He, is this show good? Do you he's like a, like a big time influencer. Like yeah, oh, I, I know him more from like content. Ton. Yeah, he's a big. Yeah, like, I know him more from content than content, the show, like gym content. Uh, but I mean, like he had yeah. Nate Diaz on in the in the build up to the to the Jake Paul Nate Diaz fight. Like, yeah, I don't think he's just coming out of nowhere. I think he just has this channel with a bunch of followers, and like he keeps posing this question, and like it gets clipped off. People, love I think it. he's smartly done something that like 
the Nelk boys did, which is like you attach yourself to fighting and there's a new audience that comes with that. And now he's leaning into that. I think he went on O'Malley's podcast, O'Malley and Tim's, and like they actually had like a really civil discussion about like a street fight, not just like grappling. Oh, yeah. And O'Malley was like, he was like, I don't really want to find out because you're gigantic, but like I think I have the skills to handle you. Uh, Do you think he's clean? I, I mean, we have the picture right here. Like, I mean, Basically everyone else. Clean. I mean, he's. I don't he's, know enough about that world, but he's spending some he's hours in the jacked. gyms if he's clean. Like he Jesus. is jacked, dude. How is that possible? How do you even get that? A lot bit? of time in the gym. A lot of time in the gym. Respect. A lot of protein, amino acids. Horse meat. That. that was the that was the key. Right, right. Um, all right. Well, uh man, great stuff from DJ. DJ was awesome. Wasn't he great? He's just couldn't get enough. He's come of him, such man. a he's couldn't come enough, such man. a long way in the interview game, like when we first met him, where he just didn't want to ever open up and give you anything. Now he's just like it just feels like what the fuck you want to talk about? Let's go, let's go talk, talk. I was like, <laughs> yeah, see, I can't man. even I can't even imagine he's, like him not opening up. Like you're just like Oh, you yeah. got sick and left? He's like, fuck, yeah, I was having diarrhea. Just... I'm like, all right. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, his fate was so his fate was so tied to the UFC brand and product and he didn't want to misstep. And then at a certain point it wasn't. And he was like, well, I'm just going to be DJ. And we love that DJ. I think we like that DJ a lot more. Once he started swearing, it all changed. Remember there was a point yeah. where even him swearing was weird. Squeaky and then he was just clean. Like, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. Tremendous. Uh, all right, gents. Much love. Good luck on Monday. Perhaps we'll talk then. Enjoy uh, vacation. As far bro. as, yeah, thank you. As far as me hosting this show, uh, the next time you'll see me doing so will be September 6th. So we'll have the Monday show and then we'll be off for two weeks. And so uh, we hope you don't miss us too much. But again, there is a Monday show. And uh, to everyone who, you know, complains about everything, how do you like us now? You're going to miss us a hell of a lot more, all right? I can guarantee that. Um, but it's a uh, it's a little break for uh, myself and the crew, and then we'll be back. A lot of shit going to happen, by the way, by the time you guys say goodbye on, on Monday, the 21st of August and September 6th. I mean, that Singapore card is actually quite good. The one coming up next weekend... Well, not this week. Like this weekend is Boston, but next weekend, Holloway, Chansung Jung, Anthony Smith, Ryan Spann, Giga Chikate, Alex Caceres, Aaron Blanchfield, Tyler Santos, Junior Tafa, Parker Porter. I mean, it's a damn good card, especially for uh, Singapore. And then the one following that is Cyril Gan, Sergey Spivak, Manol Fioro against Rose Namajunas. That's the one in Paris. It's a lot, man. Uh, that 5 a.m. start time for flight. Singapore, too. Sign me up. Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, Usyk against uh, Daniel Dubois in a stadium August 26th as well. So there's just a lot going on, and a lot will have happened. The The game will change. The next time I'm hosting this show, we'll be three days away from Izzy versus Sean Strickland. That's, That's crazy. <laughs> see you then, man. Yeah, see you then. My most uh, anticipated thanks, fight of the year. Uh, I mean, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, uh, it's going to be great. On Monday. Hopefully I'll talk to you guys then. If not... I'll be watching, listening, downloading, all that stuff and more. Uh, Frank, we could say goodbye now. I told the guys, we got to go till 4 today. <laughs> 4.37. Actually, Monday's show was shorter than this one. Didn't we have love to be. It. Oh, we love it. I love it. I want some more of it. Uh, but a great day was had, and I am excited about 2.92 at the TD Garden this Saturday night on pay-per-view, of course. Aljamain Sterling, Sean O'Malley, Zhang Wei Li, Amanda Lemos, Ian Machado, Gary, Neil Magny, Damon, Blackshear against Mario Bautista, Marlon Vera against Pedro Munoz, Chris Weidman, Brad Tavares, Gregory Rodriguez against Dennis Tuyalin. Nailed it. Austin Hubbard, Kurt Hollibaugh, Brad Katona, Cody Gibson. Shout out. Tough. Andre Petrovsky against Gerald Mearshart is on the early prelims. What the hell? Andrew Lee against Natalia Silva. Karin Silva against Marina Moroz. I mean, that's a solid pay-per-view card, top to bottom. A little something for everyone. I can't believe Petrovsky's that low. What the hell? Why is Petrovsky that low? They should have put him on the uh, main card. It wasn't like it was the featured prelim fight on ESPN. They never bumped that one up. But that low, that is a bit surprising. Maybe they'll change it. I'm looking at some 
Anthology website here. Uh, thank you very much to the aforementioned Andre Petroshki. Uh, good luck to him this Saturday. Incredible story. Easy to root for him. Uh, good luck to Shane Burgos next Wednesday. Thank you to him for his time as well. Thank you to Tim Welch. Good luck to the team. And of course, thank you to Demetrius Johnson, Mighty House, a.k.a. the GOAT himself for stopping by with such great stuff. Back on Monday, same time and place until I say... Peace.